Alright, so last night was the live letter number 66 for Endwalker and all the job changes that we're getting and they finally showed off the job skills trailer and it was great and I'm gonna quickly just go through, summarize everything I can in a quick and easy fashion for everyone to digest and in a non-spoilery way because the job action trailer does kind of have spoilers in it so I don't want to be showing that off. It, it will be in the description so you don't, so you can go watch the skills action trailer for yourself. And if you're not worried about spoilers, I do recommend watching that and seeing all that's being shown off and all the new skills because they look cool and all that. And some of the jobs are getting huge changes. But if you're afraid of spoilers, the B-roll in the background is just going to be random dungeon footage. Nothing really spoilery at all. So you're safe. Okay, so they started off with explaining the direction they're going with future expansions and all that. In that, people wanted the complexity of Heavensward, because Heavensward jobs, there was some deep, deep, deep complexity in there. But they think that with Shadowbringers, they hit a very good level of hitting a, an even spot between welcoming and complex. There's a good level of complexity, but not it's overly complex or anything like that. So they're trying to keep to the current level they're at in going forward. I don't want to change things too much or anything like that. I, I mean, they say that, but also uh, there's some huge changes. But basically, they, they want to keep it the same level of complexity to be welcoming to everyone, but still give high-end players their bit of uh, stuff to learn. Which, and then their first big announcement was basically openers and rotations are all going to be basically on a 60 slash 120 second timer. There are going to be exceptions like ley lines is still going to be 90 seconds. But most skills are going to be adjusted to be 60 seconds or 120 seconds. There are, again, going to be some exceptions, but for the mo vast majority... It's all 6120, which is huge for a lot of people. That That is huge, especially because there's like, they announced something like, for example, Dragoon has Battle Litany. That is a 180 minute cooldown. That is now going to be 120. That's kind of huge. That, that vastly changes things. That extra minute off of the cooldown length is huge for our power, so we might see nerfs elsewhere. But who knows what we're going to have to see once the f expansion finally comes out. And I'm not going to list all the examples they gave just because... Give a general idea of, for the most part, things are going to go 6120. But not everything will be. And then they went right into doing the job trailer. And the, the job trailer is in the description. You can watch it. And then when they explained everything... They didn't explain it in the order of the job trailer. Like, they did Dragoon first, but Dragoon was the fifth th thing they explained when they went over each job individually and each role. So in terms of the live letter pacing, I'm going to skip ahead until after they showed off the job action trailer to when they started explaining stuff about the roles and the jobs, which they started off with tanks. They mentioned something about using defensives at optimal times will grant you greater benefits, additional buffs for people and all that. So I'm thinking like the Blackest Knight, but for everyone kind of, everything has double uses. This will hopefully get players into using their skills more, they're using their defensives more, and also hopefully properly timing them, which is going to be even better. Because that's the big thing with defensive cooldowns is you want to time them right for when they are needed. And so actually getting the timing right, having bigger rewards is kind of interesting. What this actually is going to mean once we actually have it in our hands, who knows? We're probably going to find out once we get to the media tour. Yeah, as an idea, it sounds interesting. Hopefully it encourages more newbie tanks to use or to learn their timings better. But also a change I am kind of mixed on just because a lot of people don't know how to keep uptime properly is ranged attacks no longer break combos. 
this does a huge change. That's so useful for the higher end of, oh man, I have to avoid, I do have to be out of range for an entire GCD. Let me get in the extra attack, but I can't because it'll break my combo. But at the same time, on the lower end, newbies don't understand they don't need to run out immediately. They have time. A 10 second cast bar is a 10 second cast bar. You don't need to be out of range that entire cast bar. So I feel like this is going to lower the skill floor, but also increase the skill ceiling. It's going to be a wider range. And not entirely in a good way. Just because more newbies are going to fall into the trap of using that stuff. Using their ranged attacks when they really shouldn't be. I mean, it's at least something that'll increase the damage, probably. Maybe. Well, I don't know. We'll see. And then also they announced magic and physical damage attributes are going to be seeing parity on weapons. So, like, if you look at the magic damage attribute for a weapon and then look at the physical damage attribute, they're not... They're very different numbers. So, okay, let me pull out my Dragoon. My Dragoon has a 134 physical damage attribute and my black mage has a 174 magic damage attribute on the weapon and my dragoon has a stronger weapon than my black mage my black mage is the 510 relic and my dragoon has the 535 best in slot weapon so there is a big gap there of like 40 points and it's not even the entire gap so now Physical damage is going to be raised up to that same level. If a weapon now has 134 physical damage, after the change it's going to be the 174 that the magical weapons have. But also that means don't panic, but basically all physical weapon skills, like we're going to see our, our potencies go down. So a one, a one, or a I mean, I'm going that high. A 500 potency attack will maybe be 300 potency after. So don't panic when you see the numbers. The actual ending damage is fine. There's no bad changes there. Everything's fine. But numbers will be different. But don't panic when you see different numbers. Just, just keep a level head when you see, oh my god, all of my potencies went down. And then they moved on to individual tanks. So, Paladin, it seemed like it has a buffed up uh, Sheltron. It looked, at least to me, it looked like Sheltron 2. I don't know if that's what it actually is, but it seemed like some kind of like mirror shield that showed up around them. So I think it's safe to say it's Sheltron, personally. Uh, Requiescat no longer scales based off of your current mana. So as it is right now, Requiesca will only give you the magic boost if your MP is at 80% or higher. And, and then also give you instant casts at level 80. They're changing this so that you will always get these buffs, which is nice. That's, that's kind of nice just because sometimes in the lower level stuff, things go off the rails maybe specific fight choreography, you can't get to full mana when you normally would be at full mana, but you can still now at least get your burst phase even if it is a shortened burst phase. It's not as going to be as smooth, but it's still at least something you can do. And then they also showed off at the end, Paladin was last in the trailer by the way, and now it's first being explained. Uh, when you do Confidier, that's your magic phase finisher, you get a special three-hit combo afterwards that's super flashy, super huge. So every time you finish your magic phase, you go into this super huge three-hit combo that will do a lot of damage. So it's it's basically a four-hit finisher now. Confidier for the first hit, and then this three-hit combo for the final three hits. It does look nice, but, I mean, we'll see how it plays in practice. Is it going to be its own button? Does it replace your melee combo? Who knows? And then they went into Warrior. Uh, the big request has been 
allow people to apply their AoE buff or their buffs with their AoE. So Dragoon, or yeah, Dragoon. I'll get to Dragoon. Don't worry. Uh, so we got Storm's Eye that increases your damage dealt by 10%. This is only on your single target. Mithril Tempest, when used in the combo, will refresh, refresh Storm's Eye, but it will not apply Storm's Eye. Now it will. You can do your AoE to apply and upkeep Storm's Eye, which is great. There's also Upheaval and Onslaught all no longer use Gage, so you can use them just off cooldown as you wish. How that's going to affect the flow of uh, Warrior as a whole, we'll have to see just because no longer being tied to Gage probably means there's some other uh, cooldown reductions or such unrelated to since it does not cost Gage, they're gonna want to maybe lower the potency, add a long cooldown longer than what it already was, etc. Or maybe it won't just to bump up their damage a bit. It also got like some new finisher moves, there's like the three hit combo one, but look, it looked like kind of like a uh, feller cleave or something like that is what I've been calling it. But then there's also an inner release finishing move so that after you finish your inner release window, there's a final super hit where you jump in the air and do a, a corkscrew, not a corkscrew, but like a front flip and spin with the axe. It looks neat, but yeah, it's, it just seems to be like we're trying to be paladin now. Warrior wants to be Paladin, but will never be Paladin. And then also, Nation Flash is still amazing. It's still gonna be great, unless they're actually secretly nerfing it, and then... Yeah, that's gonna be sad. But hey, keep an eye on Nation Flash. That's gonna be... Ooh, boy. Dark Knight now, meanwhile. Uh, this one, they showed off a couple skills that look like to be a... An upgraded flood of flood of darkness. It, at least to me, it was an upgraded flood of darkness. Maybe it wasn't an upgraded flood. I, I'm pretty sure it's upgraded flood of darkness or something like that. So it's like maybe it was just normal flood of darkness. So, it, but they didn't mention anything about it. So either it is normal flood of darkness, or they're just not telling us about that one. Because the things they told us explicitly were salted earth no longer is awful to activate. It will always appear on top of you, so you no longer need a macro for Salted Earth, which is huge. That is great. I love that. That's a great change. It makes it way easier to use. Esteem will also have a new skill tied to it, so that's probably an extra button that you like. It's kind of like Dreadworm Trance, I'm going to think, is it will, it's going to act on its own, but you hit the button to do uh, the Flare, Death Flare. Ockmorn, that's it. Yeah, Ockmorn. So it's probably like that, is what I'm thinking. And then also, Dark Knight has a new single target defensive buff that is separate from the Blackest Knight. So I'm thinking like Dark Knight has its own Heart of Stone from Gunbreaker. Actually, no, it's like Intervention. It's Dark Knight Intervention, I think, because Paladin has Intervention. You put that on a fellow party member to buff the defense. I think that's actually what it is. But generally, this is one that I'm waiting on the media tour for especially if like they did give us some info but not enough for me to be like hmm that's a big change maybe i mean i like the salted earth but i'm, I'm waiting for the media tour to give any final thoughts on it which hopefully we'll get some dark knight stuff that's pretty in depth out of it then they moved into gunbreaker continuation is now built into the combo now but Burst Strike now also has a continuation. This one is kind of confusing. I think it's like the, the Gnashing Fang combo is now all one button, but Continuation is a separate button still. And then also Burst Strike has a continuation. So now Continuation has four different skills it combos off of, which is... I, I think that's a good middle ground of you're giving continuation more uses, but you're not combining continuation into the main combo. You're just keeping the main combo as one button like PvP has it. There's already been some complaining about this one, but I, th I think, personally, I think this is a good middle ground. They're not just, oh, taking away all the buttons. 
they're taking away some of the buttons, but giving one of the buttons even more use than it already had to make up for it, which I think is fine. And then on top of that, you also will be now getting three chargers for your gauge. The, the powder gauge has three slots for cartridges. And there seems to be an attack that maybe it only spends two, but I, I'm thinking that it spends all your cartridges and will change potency based on how many cartridges you have. So I'm thinking uh, the, the bard action, uh, what's it called? Uh, pitch perfect. You get one stack, two stack, stack, or three stack. One stack is currently 250 potency, two stacks is 450, and, or, no, it's 100 for one stack, 250 for two stacks, 450 for three stacks. And so, that's gonna be how the gunbreaker action works, I think, is you have a scaling potency based on how many cartridges you use, and you're gonna wanna use it at three cartridges when you can. Because it's spent to... But maybe it would have spent all three if they had all three cartridges in the gauge, which is cool. I think having more leeway for storing cartridges is nice for the flow of the job in general. And then this also has the effect of making draw even better than it was. I mean, free, free cartridges, that's nice. That, that's great. And then moving on from the tanks, we have melee. So the big announcement they made was... Faint is now virus, but reversed. So for those who don't know, back in the Aroma Reborn Heavensward era, there was a skill called Virus that Scholar had. It would reduce... At least, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Scholar. It would reduce the magic damage that an enemy did, and then there was a trait that made it also reduce the physical damage an enemy would do. So now, we have, we have that back. Faint will now reduce physical damage by, I'm gonna say, I'm thinking, be, right now, Faint lowers target's physical attributes by 10%. I'm thinking after the change, it's going to be 10% physical, 5% magical. So now melee players can help reduce the, uh, the, the magic damage of raid bosses. Because that was a big complaint of, you can't really use Faint for most raid fighting. Most raid fights use magic damage, magic raid wides, all that, magic tank busters, except for the rare occasions it's physical. So being able to finally use faint in more raiding, that's great. I appreciate that as someone who always tries to use faint. One of my catchphrases with my group is, I fainted it, so, so this is actually nice for me. And then also, same for the tanks, ranged attacks no longer will break combos. That's rough for teaching newbies not to use their ranged attack, because they really shouldn't. They should learn not to ever use it. That should be just like a high level thing where you start using it. But like, now this is going to teach newbies bad habits, I think. I think it'll overall increase the damage they're doing, but they'll be more incentivized to keep up that bad habit despite it being a bad habit of getting away from the enemy when they had no reason to run away from the enemy. But I mean, for me, this is this is huge. I'm gonna love this on Dragoon and Reaper. Uh, and then also, they mentioned the parity between physical and magic again. If you see your numbers go down, don't panic. You're still going to be doing the same damage. Wait for everyone to get to level 90, theory craft it out, math it out, see what actual parses look like, all that. Just wait. Everything's gonna be okay. So, Dragoon got some major changes. Uh, first off, Blood of the Dragon is gone. Well, it's not gone, but it's a trait. It is automatic. We are always in Blood of the Dragon mode, which... Kind of what it was already doing now in Shadowbringers? Cause like, yeah, we base- if- unless you get a cutscene or lose control of your character, Shadowbringers Dragoon should never drop Blood of the Dragon. It's a 25 second cooldown, 30 second time limit, so you have 5 seconds to hit the button. That's- that's a good bit of leeway, it's not a lot of leeway, but it's a bit of leeway, so... It was basically guaranteed to keep it up unless you got a cutscene. 
So just making it permanent as an automatic is the smart idea with how they evolve the job, I think. Further, uh, AoE is now a four-hit combo, which, okay. I guess that's the direction they're going with Dragoon, being an AoE king within the melee or something. I hope this doesn't, like, reduce the scaling of the AoE. Like, currently, Kurth and Torment is a 230 potency attack. That's going to go down to, say, 170 with the potency changes on the weapon damage. So let's just say right now, Kurth and Torment is actually 170 potency. Is that still going to be 170 potency after the update and we get a fourth hit to our combo? Or is it going to stay 170 and then the new fourth hit in the combo is going to be a massive 200 potency? That's the, the big problem there is I don't know what the new potencies are going to be before taking into account the new stuff. That's the big problem with the big weapon damage change. Basically, if unless I'm completely misunderstanding it, the relative power of melee now to melee in Endwalker, you're not going to be able to tell just because, unless you mathed out the same math that they did in the dev room, you don't know what the new potencies are supposed to be compared to the old ones. So hopefully this doesn't reduce the scaling. Hopefully this is still an upgrade to Dra Dragoon AoE. And they also did not mention Disembowel as part of the AoE. They even did get told mention like, Hey, you never mentioned Dragoon AoE and Disembowel. And they're like, No, we did. Look at the slide. The slide doesn't say anything about Disembowel or keeping up buff. So it's like, um, like, am I blind? Is Disembowel still not on the AoE count combo? Which... Everyone else got it on their AoE combo. Why can't Dragoon get it on their AoE combo? Please, game. Please. Oi, but... I, I, I just hope it disembowels on the AoE. That is all I really want. But then also, the fourth hit in the combo boosted up a new gauge. Next to our eye gauge is what looks like two little, like, scales. They're like dragon scales. And using the fourth hit in the combo gave you a dragon scale. And then also Raiden Thrust gave one of the dragon scales. But let me I'm getting ahead of my health there. So they started going through combos. They did vo uh what's the first one? Uh True Thrust, they didn't disembowel, and then they did Chaos Thrust. They never did Chaos Thrust. They did Alamorn. It's basically the exact same animation animation of Alamorn from the from the 3.3 trial, which I've been asking for that for a while as well. People were like, oh, it's just Chaos Thrust. I mean, it is, but also it isn't. And now we finally have it. And it's probably going to have a stupid name like Stardiver, but it's Alamorn to me. But then they did Alamorn, they did their combos there, the Fang and Claw, the Wheeling Thrust. They did Raid and Thrust, got a second scale in the gauge. Uh... True Thrust, or Full Thrust got a Fuller Thrust. I don't know what that's going to be called, but it's the spinning around the pole and then doing the same Full Thrust animation that we saw in the Benchmark trailer, so that one we knew about. And then they went into the Life of the Dragon. They did the same flashy stuff they did in the Strand. They did Star Diver. And then they used the new gauge. It looks like a level 3 version of Gear Skogel slash Nestrand. So you have you have Gear Skogel, which upgrades to Nestrand, which it's probably going to be a separate button and not be on Nestrand. But now we have Double Dragon Neon, as my, my static was calling it, or at least Double Dragon. So you, you use the gauge, two dragons come out, a blue and a red one, and you shoot it forward. It's literally level 1 and 2 combined into a level 3 Nostrand, or Gaius Gogol. It's now called Nost Gogol. There you go. Though I prefer Double Dragon. And that was the big Dragoon changes we got. Additionally, they also mentioned Spine Shatter having charges, I guess? Alone, that really doesn't change anything. The actual timer does, because, like, generally, if in a high-end player, like, I'm a high-end player, this will help the lower-end players who don't know how to use elusive jump right, 
but as a high-end player, I know how to use Elusive Jump, and that's my gap closer. I basically don't ever need anything else. Very rarely do I need more than just Elusive Jump. So we need to see the timer on it and see how actually useful it's going to be. But also, they didn't show any buffs. They mentioned Lance Charge, I'm pretty sure, unless I misheard. They mentioned Battle Litany, but I don't remember anything about Dragon Sight being mentioned. Which I genuinely hope that that means Dragon Sight is finally gone, because delete Dragon Sight, please. That's... It's probably not gone, it's probably still there, but oh my god, I hate Dragon Sight. It's, it's one of the worst skills in the game. I love Dragoon, but Dragon Sight sucks. It's useful, but it's so annoying to use. Outside of a static environment, at least. Monk, this job is completely reworked. I recommend looking at footage of this one to really get it, or wait until... We have more info and all that, just of how deep the complexities go, just because I'm going to sum it up as best I can in a way you, other people could understand based on what we already have. So currently Monk has Chakra. This is being moved to much earlier on in the level curve because now that uh, Grease Lightning is gone. Which I don't- did I completely miss on if they still have Grease Lightning, I think? their skill speed still increases. So they still might have Grease Lightning, but it's still just a passive. Uh, perfect balance on Monk is now Ninjutsu. It's, it's basically, if you've ever played Final Fantasy VI, Machinist became Edgar, Monk became Sabin, or Sabin, however, I prefer Sabin. So when you start perfect balance, you have your Opo Opo, your Curl, and your Raptor form. Using a skill from the forms will charge up a gauge that has three little sim symbols in it. And so it's basically just like ninjutsu, but um, less clunky. So put on your ninja. If you have ninja, go to ninja. If you hit 10, you'll get Fuma Shuriken. If you hit Chi, you get Raiton. If you hit Jin, you get Sweeton. Now, Monk doesn't have the... Tenchi, you need a full Tenchi Jin in there, but you can mix Mudra. Where Ninja, if you do Ten Ten Chi, you will lose the combo. You cannot use Ten twice, you cannot use Chi twice, you cannot use Jin twice, you can't use them three times either. Monk can. Monk can go Ten 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 and then still use Masterful Blitz. That will actually be a proper combo. So instead of the 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 six options we have on uh, on Ninja for well, yes, it's not six options. Instead of the three options you have on Ninja for a three number Mudra, you have a ten ten ten, a chi chi chi, a ten ten chi, etc. How that all, how many skills it actually has is, I don't know, maybe it's, maybe it's kind of like Astrologian 2 where it's based on the number of different seals. Like if you have two of the same, this specific skill goes off and it's not 10-10 Chi and 10-10 Jin are two different skills. We'll have to see more on that. And uh, Perfect Balance has charges, it's every 40 seconds. So you're going to be doing Masterful Blitz a lot, which is nice. Uh, apparently they took away some of your positionals, but not all of them. You still have some positionals, but I think it's to make up for the Masterful Blitz changes. In theory, it's fine, but we need to actually see how the job flows without those extra positionals. But I'll, And uh, they also get rid of Shoulder Tackle. Shoulder Tackle now has a new gap, is now replaced with a new gap closer with three stacks, and you can choose your allies, just like Black Mage's uh, Ethereal Manipulation. You can teleport to the boss with your gap closer, or you can teleport to your ally out of range of the boss if need be, which vastly increases your mobility as Monk. That's huge. 
and this maybe just had a revelation. So we're gonna get into the revelation in a bit. So let's let's just go back to Monk. Uh, a Notmon. I still saw a Notmon. We didn't see what it does, but a Notmon is still there. I think it's probably just gonna be a a chakra button. Uh, oh, after you do Masterful Blitz, so Masterful Blitz is the combo button, so you do the Ten Tenchi, the Ninjutsu. After you do that, you get Formless Fist. Formless Fist being you can start your combo from any part of your combos at all. So if you know Monk, you have the three forms. You have Curl, you have Rafter, you have Opo Opo. You have to follow them in order. You have to go around the circle. Formless Fist, which you have Form Shift, gives you Formless Fist unless you start on any button you want. That's how it's going to work in Endwalker 2. You do Masterful Blitz, and then you can just continue your combo from anywhere in your rotation. You can go straight into a Raptor form. You could go straight into Curl form. So that's, that's great. Uh, Elixir Field is one of the Masterful Blitz. Elixir Field's gone, but it's one of your Monk Jutsu. And then also, on the sides of the per the Masterful Blitz thing is two also smaller circle icons that, when you fill those up, give you access to yet another super attack. So it seems like Monk got some deep complexity and some really cool changes in there. I'm, for, f for once, interested in finally interested in monk i don't like monk i think i'm going to like this monk this this looks great then they moved on to samurai they started off saying aoe now applies your buff you can get jinpu and shifu off your aoe why didn't you say this for dragoon i would have noticed that you definitely did not say it does dragoon still not get disembowel off of their aoe oh my god uh, there's a new EI Jutsu action slash Tsubame Gaeshi, and it looked like some kind of super EI Jutsu, because it looked like they did a double Midare, but as a single attack. So I think we have a super ultra, su uh, super ultra whatever, uh, EI Jutsu. And then there's, uh, the AoE Shoha. With Shoha is the, when you have the three dots under your, your gauge, the meditation stacks. There's an AoE version of that now, so just like Guren and Sinai, there's an AoE one now. Uh, oh, Third Eye, they changed. I guess it's no longer going to be a combo action, but it does give you 10 Kenki, which means a uh, super huge skill ceiling jump for samurai needing if i don't know what the cooldown is going to be but third eye being used on cooldown to get hit by raid wide aoe's every time you get hit by raid wide aoe hit third eye that's gonna add up to a lot of kanky and that's gonna massively massively up the skill ceiling of samurai if it stays a short 15 second cooldown. That's gonna be amazing though, I think, personally. Then they moved on to Ninja. Ninja, uh, got a lot of changes. Uh, the, there's going to be a combo action linked to Raiton, Doton, and Hutan, which Hutan is now easier to apply. It seems like it has a dedicated button. Maybe, we don't know, that, but it seems like it. And the timer is now, instead of 70 seconds, 60 seconds, which, which, uh, I mean, there's the making everything on parity with 2090. That one seems weird, though, just because that 10 seconds on in, on Hutan didn't really seem to matter. There is no fourth ninjutsu, luckily, so you're still only going to have Tenshi and Jin. Shadow Fang is gone, which we got a whole lot of new stuff to replace Shadow Fang, so I don't think that's much of a loss. Maybe some potentially lost damage. Uh, Shikuchi seems easier to use. It seems like it's going to be a dash, just a plain dash move now, which is nice. But yet there's also a gap closer. The combo right on looks to be some kind of super combo uh, dash in attack, so it's a gap closer. Uh, the Doton. 
was it the, I guess the Dotan is just launching the clone, the Bunshin, at the enemy. And then there was also a wind one. No, the, the launching the, was the wind one. I don't even know if they showed the Dotan one. I have to go rewatch that, but... The, the, the new actions look cool. The problem I have is how is this going to play just because... Oh, we're not going to be making Ninja super more complex than it already is. But this seems like a lot to get into. They're, they're worried about how high the APM Ninja is. Ninja's already one of the highest APM, if not the highest APM job. So, all this new stuff just defers to me. How does this all relate to the APM? Is this a ton of weaving? How does... How do you actually use these skills in actual combat? And not just a showcase. Yeah, just... Ninja got some higher mobility, and it was already pretty mobile, but now it got even more mobility. The new skills look cool. It seems like it's going to be a lot more complex, but they insist that it's not going to be all that more complex. And then we come to Reaper. This is another one that I'm like, don't, I'm not going to go too deep into it. I'm going to go over my thoughts on it, some overview of it. But, like, this is one that seems like it's going to be extremely complex and is going to be hard to explain to newbies even once we have the full job out and can make videos and all that on it. I think this one's going to be a high skill floor, high skill ceiling. At least to me, it looks like it. I haven't had a lot of exposure to it after all. But it seems complex enough to make people have to rethink their thoughts on Reaper just of, oh man, I have to put in a lot of effort to get this done. So let's get into it. So so they introduced it as it's not a selfish DPS. Not entirely, at least. There is a synergy button that it has that will buff an ally. It seems like it's their form of Dragon Sight, almost. And you suck energy from an ally, kind of like Brotherhood, it seems. I, we didn't really get much explanation on that one. I want to see more on that. Hopefully it's not like Dragon Sight, because that'll suck. And I hate Dragon Sight. Um, they said it has Reaper has an edge in specific situations, which again, also very generic. They didn't dive too deep detail, detail into that. I want to see more on that. Uh, then they started getting into the mechanics of the job. There's three gauges. A main gauge that increases as you do attacks to use big attacks. Then there's also a second gauge that fills when you use your avatar to attack. Because you can combine with your avatar to do attacks. And they're big attacks. And that raises the se second gauge. And then the second gauge, when it's filled up enough, you can use it to combine with your avatar to go into the super mode that has a pretty long timer. It was like 30 seconds, I think. Pretty long. So it's like Dragoon. But then that, that gauge has like five dots. The first two gauges are numbers, which you can theoretically reduce them down to just the, probably just the tens place. But the numbers and the, the avatar buffed up state is five dots that have two tiers, a purple, a blue, and then empty. Using attacks can make the purple dots turn blue, and using other attacks can make the blue dots go to empty. And then after you use all the dots, I think, you lo you instantly revert back to your base form. The super form is extremely fast. It seems like a melee hypercharge if you play Machinist. It seems, it looks to be like a 1.5 GCD, and you also have skills to weave. So you're gonna do GCD off global, GCD off global, GCD off global, to just go speed right through your avatar mode. It's super fast. In the original benchmark, tr the original trailer, it looked like it was just an inner release. No, this is not inner release. This is completely different. This is extremely fast when they showed footage of it. It goes, if you're playing the job, it goes speed. But then there's also like some like kind of like stance that you have that takes like three seconds to charge up. It's longer than a GCD at least. It takes a while to charge 
but then like it also seemed to give them access to another huge hit that they could use so it's some kind of downtime skill i guess uh they have a they have a ton of mobility also they have positionals it was oh okay they the base attacks because so yeah there's three levels of attacks as i mentioned there's the base attacks there's the avatar attacks and then there's your super form attack the base level attacks do not have positionals, but yet avatar attacks do have positionals as it was, as I understood it. And because it's like your avatar attacks that have positionals, I'm going to guess it's like Kenki, where you don't get potency increases, you get more gauge for hitting your positionals. So you're going to want to hit those positionals a lot, because it's going to be worth a lot more than just, oh, 10 potency it's gonna be worth a lot i think but uh but yeah so it's speedy with the attack it's pretty mobile the big mobility comes in that you have the your gap closer is a void portal you can drop a void portal get back in you can drop a void portal in the back of the arena run up start fighting the boss when you need to escape hit the void portal instantly teleport back to where you placed the portal that's huge! That is super mobile! You can plan ahead of where you place the portal. It's like the Black Mage stuff. It's like Ley Lines, but also you're not going to be placing AoEs on your Ley Lines. Your Ley Lines is off in the distance, away from you, completely safe. That's huge for mobility! Holy crap! I, I'm like so excited for this job. It looks amazing, but it also looks extremely complex. It looks hard. It's like it looks like it's gonna be hard to put into a guide and explain it all. I think I'm getting it, and after reading the tool tips, I think I'm getting it because the Final Fantasy XIV Discord put out a document with all the trans all the translations of the tool tips they saw. So we have most of the skills translated. Some stuff is subject to change as i said this is not official this is not all the final product it's there could be changes and all that but like stuff like you get aoe at level 25 maybe even earlier we have a lot of the tooltips i i have in the description a link to the the translations again by the final fantasy 14 discord i was linked to it from somebody else in my discord so but thank them to getting you in this information on how the job works don't don't look too much at it just because you might confuse yourself it might be some of the stuff might not be right they could have translated wrong i trust them that the translations are right but maybe they translated wrong the tooltips might change once you actually once they actually finish development just because things can still change a lot in the next two months think so Take it with a grain of salt. Don't get too deep into it and confuse yourself. But to me, it seems like the job's going to be fairly complex. But I'm also extremely excited for it. It looks fun. Then they moved on to the ranged. We got... Uh, Tactician is now a 90 second cooldown instead of the... the it's currently... What is... What is Tact... Uh... 120 seconds, so Tactician, Shield Samba, whatever, Nature's Min or whatever, not Nature's Min, uh, what's the Bard one? It's Troubadour. Yeah, all of those are now 90 seconds now, so you're going to be able to protect your party with defensive buffs more often now, which is nice. And now for the specifics of the Bard, or the Bard... Uh, each, there's a new part of the song gauge that seems to be like, once again, like Samurai, the Sen gauge. Each song gives you a Sen or something. Uh, each song has a new action related to the song. It also buffs everyone when you use it. And then still deciding on if these buffs will affect Bard. They still don't know if your own songs will affect you. So we'll see... Apex Arrow has, uh, not Apex Arrow, yeah, no, Apex Arrow has a combo buff, or a combo action on it now, so you're gonna Apex Arrow, Super Apex Arrow. Oh yeah, and also Bard, uh, Bard, uh, the songs are now 45 seconds long. 
So instead of 30 seconds, 30 seconds, 20 seconds to cut off Army's Paeon, it's going to be 45, 45, that's 90 seconds, and then 30 seconds is going to be the cutoff point for a two-minute bard rotation. That's how they did the bard rotation now to make it line up with the 60, 120 that they're trying to do. That makes a lot of sense. Now, we didn't actually see the tooltips, obviously, but that's what I think is going on, is 45, 45, 30 for a two-minute bard rotation. And what I noticed specifically about the bard one was not even just the rotation. This is another one where it's like, we have to wait for all the info from the media tour to really make any final conclusions on it. But bard was in the, zo the currently unannounced zone that looks like an island floating in the sky that some of us have been theorizing is another crossover kind of thing. I'm not going to say any more than that to avoid spoilers, but I noticed it, and it's... I'm... Yeah, it's unannounced. We don't know what it is, but they showed it off now, finally. But what it is, we'll see. I'm very... I'm very curious. But uh, Bards are lame, and we have Machinist, which now has a chainsaw. They're going all in on the Edgar side and finally gave it Chainsaw. It might actually be like a... Someone theorized in my Discord that it's a like an inner release kind of thing or like... It's a combo of reassemble drill. That when you reassemble, drill will become Chainsaw instead of just being drill. Potentially possible, but also I'm not sure. It, co it could be, which would be neat, but uh... Reassemble also has two charges. Shotgun still seems to be like a uh, spread shot, but also some, I think they used Reassemble before that. So it could be spread, uh, spread shot becomes shotgun after Reassemble. Uh, it could be unrelated. We'll have to see. It could just be spread shot is upgraded to shotgun permanently because we didn't see spread shot in there. Did not see spread shot, so... That could just be an upgrade. Two reassemble charges, as I said, and uh, Automatron Trick Queen got a super ultra finisher punch. Instead of just the big punch it has now, it now has an extra ultra punch now. That's the, the, another, uh, the two themes of Endwalker seems to be making things a lot more, more mobile, making super ultra versions of stuff they already have, and yeah, that seems to be what a lot of jobs got. But not all the jobs, not all the jobs. And Dance is one of those exceptions just because it didn't seem like they got any, like, super ultra versions of stuff they already have. Uh, effects like Flourishing Cascade are now going to affect single target and AoE. So that, that makes going back and forth between uh, the two is... Great, so you have Cascade. That's a 50% chance off of normal Cascade to get Flourishing Cascade to use Reverse Cascade. Now it seems like if you use Cascade and get Flourishing Cascade, you can use Rising Windmill, the AoE skill, which is going to make rotations a bit more complex on like, oh, there's two enemies. I can use the AoE skill. Which, that that's nice. Uh, Tech... Technical Step, Improvisation, and Devilment now have combo skills off of it. And there's more and new buffs. We didn't really get too much on that, but that is there's more buffs to Dancer. When you're dancing, you know how your single target buttons are the ones that turn into your dance steps? AoE now also turns into your dance steps. So you can use either set of buttons to do your dances, which is also great. That's huge quality of life for dancers. You don't have to swap back and forth in AoE situations. And Esprit or Espirit is guaranteed on your attacks. When you attack, you are guaranteed some Spirit for self-generation, keep in mind. Whoever you dance partner will also generate you a Spirit, but it is not guaranteed still that is still random. So they're more consistent, but not entirely consistent. But in general, it seems like they gave dancers some interesting new stuff that will be cool to look at when we get more info. What I'm most curious of, though, is what is that blue phoenix that they throw? 
I'm thinking one of the combo attacks, probably the Devilment one. And then they moved on to the mages. And then Adol is now literally just Virus. 10% magical down, 5% physical down. It's literally just Virus again, which is hilarious. They got rid of Virus and now Virus is back. Welcome back, Virus, I, I guess. Uh, okay. Uh, moving on to Black Mage. Enochian is gone. It is now just a trait, similar to Blood as a Dragon. Swapping between Astral Fire and Umbral Ice Stances will make a new action available. There's a new thing in the gauge, because uh, the, the compass is already extremely complex. They had to make it even more complex. The little, like, spear that pokes off to the left, it's already on the gauge already, but it, like, doesn't have anything on it. The little spear that pokes off towards the left on the compass, that is now an actual element thing that you have to keep track of. And that seems to be the combo skill that activates whenever you do, uh, whenever you swap between the elements. So now you have to, so you swap between the elements and then you have a combo attack that is ice and fire at the same time. It looks cool. Uh, still no utility. You're still a selfish DPS. Firestarter and Thundercloud buffs, the procs, now have longer timers, which is really cool. I like that. You have more leeway with using your procs and not just losing them. You have leeway to use them even if you don't get new procs. Uh, Blizzard 2 has some changes, AoE changes and improvements. They were kind of general on that, but making Red Mage ice stuff less garbage, especially Blizzard 2, is a good thing. Basically, any change to Blizzard 2 is going to be good, I think. Uh, we almost had a new suffix in Final Fantasy history for Fire 5 and Ice 5. We're getting a Blizzard 5 and a Fire 5. But now it's going to be High Fire and High uh, Blizzard, I guess. And it seems like they might be Fire 3 I or Blizzard 3 changes. They might be just straight upgrades on those. But, I mean, even if it is just straight upgrades, that is nice, flashier, I guess. That's more powerful, etc. But it might be other stuff we'll have to see once the... That's another thing where I have to wait for the, the media tour. And, but also, they did reveal that Sharpcast will now have two charges. You can use Sharpcast more within your rotation, get more fire starters, more thunderclouds. Makes you a lot more flexible. That's another thing. This is the flexibility expansion. A lot of jobs, in, in addition to their mobility, have a lot more flexibility in their rotation, more recovery forms, etc. So that's, that's nice for Black Mage with how they need to be turret. That's good. Red Mage got a new part of their gauge as well. Whenever you do a melee attack, you get like a diamond in the, in the bottom area. There's uh, three diamonds that you fill up. And if you do three Molinets, you have a finisher. If you do your main single target combo, you can do a finisher. Your Verholi, Ver, uh, Flare, Ver, or Scorch is now all AoE. There's also a further finisher after Scorch. So you will do Verholi, Scorch, and then the new skill that looks like you're throwing roses at the enemy. A big spiky rose. And that looks like AoE too, so you now they're gonna keep get adding more and more finishers on top of your finishers. Hope you like finishers in your finishers, because you got finishers in your finishers. But back to the the three diamonds. This is now instead of using your melee combo activates your uh your your finishers, your verify your verholi and all that. Having three diamonds is how you can do that. Because now, if you do three Molinés, you will get three diamonds. And you can use your finishers now. Which actually makes the fact that your finishers are all AoE. Verholi is AoE. Scorch is AoE. You can use them for AoE now. It's not just Moliné, Moliné, Moliné. Go back to your normal AoE rotation. They added a lot to your AoE rotation here. That's nice. There's also a new special defensive buff that is a giant, it's a huge bubble that you put up. I don't know if it's like, you probably just, 
instantly apply it to everyone in range and it's a short defensive buff. But that, it's neat looking and will probably be bring some extra utility to prog in raid scenarios. They lowered all the black and white mana increases. You get less black and white mana, but everything costs less mana. You will need less mana to do your single target rotation. It is no, er, your single target melee combo. It is no longer 80 mana. It is now 50 mana. And your AoE is still 20 mana per use of Molinae. But because of the changes to having that little three hits makes you do your finisher, you only you don't need to have it cost any more or less. So your gains are lower, but you need less to do your combos and your AoEs. Further, they changed how manification works. It's no longer doubling how much mana you get or how much mana. So if you have 10 mana in black and white and you use manification, it becomes 20. No, you get a free combo out of it. You will get 50 mana just from using magnification. If you have zero mana and use magnification, you will have 50. It makes getting into your melee phase a lot faster. Also, engagement and displacement are now the same potency. You can actually use displacement specifically for the gap uh, creator. If you can just stay in melee range and engagement, good on you. But if you can use the backflip, you can use the backflip for the backflip and not, oh, this does more damage, so I want to be using the backflip. That's a good change in my, uh, in my eyes. So it seems like they really tuned up the flow of Red Mage. They made it faster, they made it smoother, they made your finishers usable in AoE. This seems like a good, a good evolution for Red Mage. And then Summoner is basically the third new job of the expansion. Summoner is entirely new just about. You have your Demi Bahamut phase, you have your Demi Phoenix phase, but your dots are gone completely. You no longer have dots. Bio and Miasma are gone. You are now all just normal damage. You're, they're really going all in on the summoner aspect because you don't just have Eggies, you don't have your Demi Bahamut. You will be summoning Garuda, Ifrit, and Titan. You're not actually summoning them because they're not primals, but they're the primals. It, it's hand, they were hand wavy about it. They probably explained it in the lore a bit better, but like you will be summoning the primals to boost your attack. You'll gain new attacks upon summoning the primals. And you'll, you'll summon the primal, you'll summon Titan. He'll do his under the weight super ultimate attack. And then you can start throwing attacks based on Titan that are earth-based. You'll do big earth-based attacks, a giant clap attack and all that. And you're going to be using all three. And it seems there's like no skills to summon. It. Summoner has very, very, very few skills now. It looks like you have less skills than Dancer now. You will have less buttons than a Dancer, which already has very few buttons. And it's going to be a long rotation. So it seems like they just go... They didn't show Dreadworm Trends. We don't think so, or at least nobody I talked to says they saw Dreadwolf Tramps. So you're going to go Demi Bahamut phase. And then when you finish Demi Bahamut phase, you will get three jewels on your uh, UI, your gauge. And using a jewel, will summon the primal. You'll gain their primal abilities, and then you'll uh, finish up. You'll, you'll summon the primal, use your special charges that you get, and then you'll summon the next one. So you'll summon Ifrit, use all his buffs. Summon Titan, use all his buffs, summon Garuda, use all her stuff, and then you'll summon Phoenix and do it again. You'll get three new jewels after you get done with Phoenix. You'll get the Ifrit, Titan, and Garuda jewels, and you'll repeat. So it seems like it's going to be Bahamut, Jewels, Garuda, Jewels, Bahamut, Jewels, Garuda, Jewels, etc. for the entire fight. You're going to be ping-ponging back and forth between using your big summons and the smaller summons that buff you, which is pretty cool in terms of a, a change. It looks really fun. Uh, Carbuncle seems like the base pet now. There is no more Ifrit, Eggy, and such. 
those are going to be the Eggy Glamours now. You're going to have Carbuncle, and the Eggies are now just Glamour. It seems like he's just there for moral support. I don't think anyone saw a single attack out of Carbuncle at any point through any of the video. I was watching and I didn't see Carbuncle do anything, but I was also slightly distracted on all the new sh fancy stuff, so it's like... So there's been a huge shift for Summoner. It, it is basically an entirely new job. They didn't really go into how the leveling curve is. What I'm thinking is you're going to still get Dreadworm Trance, but Dreadworm Trance is just going to turn into Demi Bahamut once you have Demi Bahamut. So I think that's how it's going to go for leveling. But also, uh, level 8 or 90 Summoner looks like it has basically no cast times. They spent most of the showcase of... They did extra showcasing of Summoner just because it's basically a new job. And he barely ever stood still to cast. Basically, other than Ruin 3 or whatever, almost nothing in your toolkit has a cast bar. You're going to be the most mobile mage now by far. Even more mobile than Red Mage. Red Mage has been vastly outdone in terms of mobility. The only thing that seemed to have long cast times was Ifrit, and that has longer cast times because the skills are so strong. And I think this is a really good direction to take Summoner. It looks fun, but I'm also concerned about the fact that it looks like a two-minute rotation, and that's one of the criticisms people have had for Summoner for a while is, oh my god, it's a two-minute rotation. If I die at any point in this, everything is ruined. So we'll have to see how it actually affects that. Is it actually going to be some kind of two-minute rotation? Hopefully not. Hopefully it will be a bit more lenient. They also considered removing Rays because of how mobile Summoner is and leaving only Red Mage to have her Rays, but they kept Rays, they kept Resurrection for Summoner, so we'll, we'll see. You're basically never going to use Ruin, it seems like, but we'll have to let people get their hands on it to more go in-depth on how new Summoner works. It looks pretty complex. At least as a little bit, despite how few buttons there are. But it looks at least really interesting, and I'm looking forward to it. And the healers, this is this is one of the funniest parts. So let, let's just start off. So healers. Everyone, every healer now has a single target buff of some kind. So basically, even if it is just one button they can use every two minutes or whatever, everyone has astrologian cards now is how I'm considering it. Which is okay, sure. Buffs up everyone's utility. All DPS actions for the healers that aren't instant have a 1.5 uh, cast time. So the, while the recast time will still be 2.5, it's a 1.5 cast time. So you can DPS easier, you can slide cast easier, you can be mobile e It's just way easier to DPS as a healer now. Healer Limit Break 3, the one that raises everyone, is 30 Yalms, I'm pretty sure right now. It's a 30 Yalm Limit Break. Yeah, I just checked. It's 30 Yalms, which is big enough for most arenas if you stand in the middle, but not all arenas. Some arenas are too big now. It's a bit too big for Healer AoE to reach the entire thing. So now, they buffed it up to... 50 Yalms, which will basically cover m not every arena in the game, because I think some 24-man uh, arenas is still going to be too big. But most every arena in the game, if you stand in the middle of the arena, you will raise everyone. That's nice. That's a good change. Someone in my Discord thinks that it's them increasing the size of arenas, that they're going to have bigger arenas more often now. I don't think so, because why break something immediately after fixing it? I think it's just, they're going to have the same size arenas, but they're going to be less punishing to have the same size arenas. Okay, and then we get into the actual individual jobs. White Mage has this weird, like, totem thing that if it gets hit by an enemy, it pulses with a giant heal. So you place it down when an enemy's going to do a bunch of raid-wide damage, it will instantly heal everyone up after it gets hit. It also seemed like you have another button where you place it down with the same button 
and then you hit that same button to make it explode with a huge heal. So you have a place and an explosion, it seems like. And they said it ties in with lilies, so there's that. Uh, Fluid Aura is gone, finally. Fluid Aura had no reason to exist. Divine Venison now has Chargers, which I love. I love Divine Venison. It's super useful, especially for big pulling tanks. Just throw it on the tank and then just run next to them, and they're never going to take any damage. And if they do, just throw regen on them too. That's nice. It also kind of seemed like they got Glare-er and Holy-er, but I'm not sure. It seemed like a stronger Holy, but we'll have to wait for the actual tooltips to come out for those. They didn't go too deep on White Mage. They were very, very general with White Mage. Astrologian, though, they had to go in-depth with, and they kind of failed entirely because Astrologian is very different. They once, of, once again have changed cards. Cards are no longer working the same way. Divination no longer works off of seals because they had one seal and used divination. So... Divination works differently, cards work differently, the enhancement off of seals applies to yourself. So i that not sure what that means. Minor Arcana is also separate again. Minor Arcana is its own separate thing that seems to be like an AoE buff. So instead of giving everyone divination for an AoE buff, you give everyone Minor Arcana as an AoE buff. Redraw is no longer three charges, you can only redraw once. Uh, you have AoE and Off you have an AoE heal that also gives an offensive buff. They also talked about giving gravity some kind of extra effect without removing the stun from Holy or giving a stun to gravity. And because they're no longer a shield healer, Diurnal Sect and Nocturnal Sect are gone, but Neutral Sect will remain and have the same effect, basically. And you always have Diurnal Sect on, essentially. It's basically doing what a it's doing a Blood of the Dragon, just becoming a permanent trait. But, like, yeah, I don't know. It, they really, really didn't explain Astrologian too well. There was, like, a lot of very... I, very confusing statements in there. This is another one where we need to dive in deep. We need to wait for the 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 media toy to come out and show us all the tool tips and really explain to us better how this one is working. Because the card system is complex. The card system has always been complex. So changing it again is going to make it complex to understand. But once we have concrete tool tips and all that to explain to us, it's going to be... It's going to be better. But alright, let's take a comedy break. So, Scholar. They're leaning more into barriers, it seems like, because it's going to be more a shield healer with the shield healer slash pure healer split. They're probably going to give Scholar some stronger barriers. Uh, there's a targeted single person buff, like we mentioned. Uh... There seems to be a stronger Biolysis and a stronger Broil. Uh, yeah, unless they just didn't tell us about any of the changes, that's really it. Because here comes the comedy portion. So, we talked about Dragoon, now has two charges of Spine Shatter, making them Mo Mobile. Monk has a new Gap Closer, you can target allies, they are now more mobile. Ninja Shikuchi is now different. You can now better move around with it. it. It seems better. That's great. Ninja already is mobile and has Shikuchi. Reaper has its void move that lets, us, lets it teleport back and forth. Healer GCD for damage attacks has been lowered to 1.5, which increases all healer mobility. Black Mage already can be super mobile if you have an ally to teleport to and back to your ley lines. It's limited, but it's still mobility. Red Mage has already been super mobile. Summoner was already mobile, and now it's like 90% instant casts. So, everything is a lot more mobile, okay, right? Yeah, we have a lot of stuff. 
that makes everyone move better. Oh, and Warrior has its dash attack, its gap closer off cooldown now, doesn't take gauge. So everyone is mo mobile now. So they gave Scholar a movement speed buff. We have in battle Peloton. We already had that. It's called Sprint. Really? I mean, it all, it's also including a damage reduction. It's not just a speed buff. But the main thing they talked about it was, this is a movement speed buff. That's amazing. You should love that it's a movement speed buff. Not really when you can just sprint. The, the way I see it as this, I'd, I'd... Some people are like, oh, this is going to be helpful. This is a lot more useful than you think it is. I'm not seeing it just because of the sprint. Just because of sprint. The only people I could see this potentially helping, and I don't see this helping them at all because the speed didn't seem all too fast, is disabled players. If this can actually help dis disabled players move better and all that, I'm all for it. But also, are people going to actually be able to move better with it? Is it actually going to be that much faster? Is it going to help disabled people get out of AoEs better? I have my doubts. And that was the only major bullet point they had for Scholar when they went over each individual job. So it's like, is, I tend not to really want to go deep into like, I, I am all for play what you want, play what's fun for you, keep doing that. But like, this is kind of a really, really disappointing showing for Scholar. Extremely disappointing. I was hoping for some major changes, but that's, this is what we got, I guess, which it's funny that, oh man, the speed buff when everyone is now super mobile and now uh poor scholar poor scholar sage looks better in every way sage meanwhile is a dps healer you are extremely encouraged to dps because instead of a fairy you have dance partner now whoever you partner ideally going to be the tank will be healed anytime you attack the boss or an enemy or whatever. You will be healing just by doing damage. And because it's faster than a fairy, you will be healing faster. And because the the potency is 170, the current potency for embrace from the fairy is 150. So, I mean, again, this is pending. They can change the numbers at any time. They can change the numbers a lot. Maybe Fairy got a buff. Maybe it's 200 now. But if these numbers will be the same, Scholar, or not Scholar, Sage has a better Fairy than Scholar has. And that's very bad. The Autonomous Fairy is weaker than your constant attacking. And you can constantly attack because you have good movement speed. You have a 1.5 GCD, so you can always just quick cast, get on moving. Your ability to move and damage is almost unhindered. So that's even more against it's in favor. So that's, that's not good. Uh, they didn't really go into the unique resources of Sage all too much. They were very generic on that. There's some, there's a stance you have to turn on to apply a dot to the enemy, which is weird. That one's also kind of poorly explained. And But the healing, the, the job looks, again, like Reaper, looks very complex. There's another one that we, this is one that even if they explained it well, I think we would need our hands on it just to test with and see all the numbers and all that to get any real feel on it. I mean, like, it has, like, a gap closer. It can gap close itself, so it has huge mobility as well. Uh, yeah, it seems to have a lot of good stuff. It has a bunch of hots. It has heals over time. It has shields. It seems like really good healer all around. And I have in the description another link, a third link. We had the link to the job trailer, a link to Reaper translations, and now a link to Sage skill translations. But this one is a Reddit thread. And apparently the the translations for the Reddit thread are definitely not all entirely correct. 
So again, but grain of salt, things can change. Even if translations are correct, they might change stuff. So look at that if you'd wish for the tool tips. But like, you know, this one is one that I'm definitely pending any real big thoughts, bigger thoughts, until we have more info. But the general thought of this seems way better than Scholar in every way, just about. We need, again, we need to actually see it. We need to get it actually playing. But yeah, it, this seems like way better than Scholar. Unless you really don't like the flavor or the specific skills that it deals with. Or being a DPS healer, I guess. But you should be a DPS healer no matter what healer you pick. DPS does help the party. And then that finally covers it for all the jobs and their changes. We, they've finished up, they rounded up, and then they moved on to other stuff. But that, that's all the job changes. That took a while to go through. And yet this is still shorter than what it took them to go through. That was, like the DPS themselves took like an hour for them to go through. And that was without like big analysis that I was giving for some stuff. So yeah, that covers the jobs. That's my insight on it all. My pending opinions. Scholar seems dead is what I came away with. Everyone's mo more, more mobile. Everyone has more flexibility in their rotations. Everyone has big super moves now. And then moving on to the small stuff. Let's move on to the small stuff. But I mean, it's not all small stuff. Some of this is really important despite how small it is. So it's small in size, but not importance to start. Raid Finder, if you're pugging with Raid Finder, you need one, you will get one barrier healer and one pure healer when you queue, no matter what. So they, they're making sure you have one of each for raiding. A lot of people like argue, miss like the point of this. So let me explain. When you're not best in slot, fights can hurt. Like I don't really, I never really got the idea, oh, you don't need shields w shields when you're best in slot. But not everyone is best in slot. Not everyone is going to be best in slot the moment they begin. Not everyone is a day one raider. Not everyone is an ultimate raider. Not everyone gets into raiding with tons of backing behind them. Crafters and gatherers to help them get gear, to buy them gear or anything like that. Not everyone has that backing they are on their own but they still want to get into it they have some gear but not a lot but they will die if they don't get a shield especially in the later fights because they're not in perfect gear they might be they might be able they might be a good player they might be a really good player they just don't have the backing or the time so they slowly so in what little time they have through a week to play they can get to the final fight basically in a day or two let's say but they don't have the they don't have the gear to keep going they have to just get shields or will die you can't use gear as an excuse for no shields when you don't have gear gear is not the beginning gear is not how you start gear is how you end that's so it's like i i i don't know people it's a we it's weird it's weird that people point at that like ha that's a dumb change and then also party finder has its own pure healer shield healer split they are two different rows in the list so that you can make it's easier to pick out the pure healers and the shield healers for making sure you have one in party finders which again even if extremes are easier content too you're gonna want a pure healer and a shield healer because not everyone is in god tier gear. Not everyone's already cleared the savage tier. You have to keep that in mind. Not everyone is already a god. But also in Party Finder they're also adding uh, a weekly loot option thing. So uh, the the so raids have a weekly lockout. You can clear once a week to get chests. You can now set this so you can now turn that on so that if someone tries to join and they've already cleared, they can't join. That's great. That makes sure everyone can get their weekly rewards and have chance at full loot. They have a chance, they're not guaranteed to get full loot, but they have a chance at full loot just because 
they might win something that we wouldn't have a chance to even loot. They wouldn't ha they wouldn't get all the loot to begin with to dole around just because if you don't have eight people who haven't cleared for the week yet, you get less loot. So making sure all eight people have not cleared yet means you get more loot. And then also search results will filter out one player per job parties you cannot join. So if you are Dragoon and a party already has Dragoon in it and has that turned on, it won't show up for you so it won't clutter up your list. Which is, wait, that's, that's good. They also have changed duty rewards for extremes and savages. Extreme fights will now always drop a weapon and a weapon coffer. So you'll get a random weapon upon killing the boss, but also a coffer that whenever you open it will give you a weapon of the job you are on. So you can get a spear drop, but if the sage gets the coffer, they will get their new list. They will still get their weapon. So two people potentially can get a weapon every fight, but at worst, one person every fight will get the weapon they want. Guaranteed. That's good. That makes farming extremes faster for weapons. This also is being applied to the Coils of Bahamut and Alexander Savage. The, because all gear in uh, Coils is random. All the gear is random. You don't get any drops. You don't get any coffers. You don't get even tokens to trade the tokens into Rowena's people to get the weapons and stuff from inside. You had to just get the random drop. Now you just need to get the coffer and you get the drop guaranteed. Long as you get the coffers, you're good. That's a good change for anyone farming those items for the glamour or anything. It really is just glamour, but hey, it's an option. And then going forward, raids will be coffers only still, so it, it's it's great that they're letting you gear up. There's still going to be some randomness, randomness, but you can at least still get geared up eventually. And then they went on to some quality of life for the HUD. So, conditional buff. So, you know, like on Black Mage, there's Firestarter, there's th Thundercloud, Bard has the, the heavier shot procs. Basically, any proc kind of skill or skill that will activate another and have a buff icon for it, you can now separate your, con your buffs into a conditional buff UI element that is separate. So you can have your normal buffs, your battle litany, your lance charge, your all those buffs as their own bar, and then off to the side, made extremely huge so you can see them bigger, just your proc bar. That is great. Keeping track of procs can be annoying with these. I want to have all my little buffs be extremely tiny so I can see them. I can see the timers big enough for me, but seeing procs is hard because of how small it is. I can't, if there's like five buffs in there, which one's the proc? I, oh, it's that one. Okay, I have this long on it. Oh no, it's about to run out. Now I can separate it off and know at all times, okay, I have a proc. Okay, I have a proc. Okay, I have two procs. That, that's, that's super, super nice. That is game changing for people with, for jobs with procs. Further, they've improved ground targeting functionality. There's new settings added. You can turn on a setting so that you can press the action again to place the marker. So you can, if you have Asylum on F1, you hit F1 to get it active to get it started then you hit f1 again to place it that's cool further and the more important thing that i think is amazing and they should have added sooner is they prevent the cursor from going out of range of where you can place it so if a so if a skill has a range of 15 yams and you can only place it 15 yams away when you try to move it beyond the 15 yams your mouse cursor will keep moving, but the area of effect will not. So you won't end up trying to place something and fail because it was too far away. It will always be within range, and that's great. And especially for stuff like Loom or Shikuchi for Ninja, as it currently is, it, it's, it's great. It's so much better. 
Salted Earth is no longer one of the skills you need to use it for, but in general, it's great that the skills that still are ground targeting are much easier to use. It, I love it. It's great. And then another UI thing they added is they will display party members' target when they are casting something. They'll show the letter of the enemy or the number of the player. So now, you won't be trying to raise the same target as healers. So if a healer is trying to raise target A, if, or not target A, uh, if a healer is trying to raise party member 3, and you as the other healer start trying to raise party member 3, you can stop, you can go move on to someone else, raise someone else, because you can see that that raise is going at party member 3. This doesn't change anything for swift cast raises. If you swift cast raise, there's no preventing that. You're gonna raise the same target by accident. There's no preventing that, basically no matter what. But what this also means is that we can delete raise macros finally. They can- you can delete your raise macros, please! Like, please, just- just delete your raise macro. Raise macros are not as good as you think they are. Please, just stop. Please, get rid of it. The only problem is this does not work for alliance members yet. If you're trying to raise across alliances, it does not work. You can't raise across alliances. It will not- you can raise across alliances, but it won't tell you the target. They're gonna have to figure something out for that, but that could be something we see in future as well. And another thing is, HP bars will now display when a player is dead, even when under the below 100% HP mark. So as it is, when you have H, when you have it set to show HP bars always, when someone is dead, you will see the empty HP bar. When you have it set to see HP bars when below 100%, 0% will not count. The HP bar will disappear. Now you can actually see the HP bar when they hit zero, so you can find people on the ground easier. That's a good change. I like that, especially if you t can toggle it on and off. Because I, I imagine in something like Bosia, it could get in the way. But general content? That's amazing. And even in Bosia, where like the, arena, the edges of the arena are all sparkly and shiny because it's filled with electricity, seeing people in there can be difficult. Not if their HP bar is floating right above them. That's good. And then they also announced Unreals are being deleted temporarily. They will return in 6.1. And apparently this was them testing how to do stat squishes, essentially. So if this was a reverse test for stat squishing. I just- I didn't do Unreal as much, just because they didn't give us enough variety. The same fight over and over does get boring. They should have given more variety, I would have liked that. Maybe in Endwalker we'll have more variety for Unreal's and that'll be nice. Then they started talking about belts being dead, which we already know this. The only exception to the rule now is speed belt. If you have a speed belt from Eureka, keep it. You will be able to trade it in for a new ring with the same effect as speed belt. It'll be the speed ring, but you need the speed belt to trade it in. So speed belt still is a thing, but you will have to keep it to trade it in for a new item because belts will no longer be usable. No one will be able to wear belts. Be sure to retrieve your materia. Be sure to extract materia if you want. You're still going to be able to do a couple of things like like the the removing materia from me removing melds, but a lot of stuff is going to be no longer accessible. You could still trade it into your grand company. Just be just prepare now if you're already playing the game to be ready to be ready to just get rid of your belts. Get prepared now. Prepare ahead of time. Maybe start unmelding any belts you have and then just be ready and start migrating any belts you're not using to main inventory so you can get ready. Uh, any belts you have crafted for leave turn-ins, turn them in now and stop doing belt leaves. Those are going away. That's really the only big thing is leaves. Be worried about that if you have any belt-based leaves. And then they've also mentioned the, the stat squish again. 50 to 80 is going to be basically an 80% stat squish. So instead of doing 100,000 damage, you'll see 20,000 damage from an attack, which is reasonable. 
They don't want they don't want the game to break from having too big of numbers, too much floating text, etc. So yeah, we we already knew about this basically. Just remember, our power levels are not going down, only the numbers are. You don't have to worry. The power levels will remain, remain, remain the same, they will remain the same, but the numbers are going down. And also, each individual duty unsynced will get a special echo that will change depending on the duty. So if... So if Garuda needs a 5% echo, it will have a 5% echo. But Leviathan might have an 8% echo. So that it'll change, the power will change based on each individual thing when you go to unsync. Which is a good way of doing it. Give every individual thing its own balancing, that's smart. I, at least I think so. And then there's also a dungeon change. So consider a dungeon. When you kill an enemy, you get EXP. You will no longer get EXP when you kill that enemy. Instead, it will make the EXP of the boss go up. They're consolidating EXP gains onto bosses, which is a neat change. They're making it less worrying of, oh, I need to be alive for every enemy. Bosses will always give you the EXP. And also, I guess that incentivizes you to finish entire dungeons. You can't just get halfway to the final boss and oh I'm just gonna dip out no you need to continue to get your exp not that I think that was ever a problem I don't think people ever really dipped out mid dungeon because they leveled up really I mean I'm sure some people did it but in general it wasn't a huge widespread thing but yeah killing an enemy will not directly give you exp but you will get the exp for it when you kill the boss that's a neat way of doing things it also kind of makes food a bit less important to have on at all times. You can just eat right before you finish the boss. That, I, I, I think that's also a good thing of you're not trying to make sure you have food, you're not kicking yourself if you forgot food. Even if 3% isn't a lot, it does add up. And they also did this change to be able to better do multiple jobs as you're going through the game. You can now do multiple jobs up to level 90 just fine. You can level multiple jobs. That's it. They specifically want you to be playing multiple stuff and not also not having to waste EXP. So they're making it easier and I can get down. I'm down with that. Especially now that we have 19 jobs in the game. Having consolidated EXP is good. And that was it for the battle stuff. Then they moved on to some gatherer stuff quick. Um, they're getting rid of high quality, which means your EXP rates are going to go down. You're going to level slower unless they're also increasing EXP gains for normal items. This is, according to them, to reduce bloat, but also that's not really a thing unless you're a hoarder. And if you're a hoarder, you're not going to see any benefit from this. You're still going to hoard a billion items. You're still going to have way too many items than you should. You're just going to have different items clogging your inventory that you could be getting rid of. I don't really see how it's reducing bloat in the way they say it's going to. Because anytime I gathered and if I was like, oh, I'm trying to gather high quality so that I can make good stuff later. Oh, I want to have... I want to have materials to be able to do this craft later. And if I need high quality, I'm only going to keep the high quality. I'm not going to keep both the no quality and the high quality. And if I do, it's because it doesn't matter. Or I'm just like, eh, I might as well. I have a billion pieces of room. I have tons of inventory. I might as well keep it. And when I start getting filled up on inventory, I'm like, oh, my inventory is starting to get low. Maybe I should start doing some inventory management. And so I manage my inventory. Oh, this is no quality? Get rid of it. Keep the high quality. So, like, it, it makes gathering, leveling gathering slower. And makes leveling crafting harder. Because if you have high quality items after this change, they will not give you base quality when crafting. So, they're removing high quality from gathered items, enemy drops, token exchange materials, a bunch of stuff is losing high quality. But like, crafted gear will still have high quality. 
So you will still need to, as a crafter, be making stuff high quality. But now that's harder because you can't supplement bad gear with high quality items. High quality items with a bit of an equalizer. You could get by something a little above you potentially just because you had high quality items to bridge the gap between, oh, if I just had a little more stats. You don't need the little more stats, you have high quality items boosting up your base collectability or base high quality. So basically, this just made, unless they're boosting the base EXP, made leveling harder in terms of EXP gains and made leveling harder in that it's harder to high quality stuff. This is really weird to me. I'm not, I mean, maybe once it's actually implemented, I'll like it, but right now, I don't think it's a good change. I don't, I'm not, this is one of the things I'm like, oh, this change was not good. I'm not really a fan, especially because also fishing. How is fishing going to work? Because uh, high quality based gathering actions are going to be changed to affect quantity. But also, if you're a fisher, every fisher knows Mooching is based off of high quality. If a fish is high quality, you can mooch it. So how how is mooching going to be taken into account? They didn't really say. Is it just going to be every fish has a listed breakpoint within their numbers hidden in the code? That, oh, at 18.7 yalms or ilms or whatever the size of the fish is, that's the breakpoint for mooching. Because fish, fish wheeling is... A huge thing for a lot of fish. How does this affect perception? Like, th there's a there's a lot of things that's like, oh, well, this changes everything. And um, it, like I said, maybe maybe I just need to see it implemented. Need to, they're going to explain all the gathering, crafting stuff more in the next live letter. So I'm gonna watch that one and see what's all going on. But I'm very curious of how this is going to affect everything. So hold your hold your final thoughts, I guess, until next live letter. And also quests, challenge log, achievements, all based on high quality stuff. Those are going to be changed. So the quest that asks ask for 10 of a high quality something will no longer ask for 10 high quality somethings. Um. Yeah, just wait for the next live letter. And now for some final miscellaneous changes they mentioned. Teleport fees are changing. The cap is no longer 999 gil. So if you try to go from Costa del Sol to Kugane, it will be 1,442 gil is what they showed off. However, teleporting is generally in some cases cheaper. If you're trying to go a short distance, but not er, a decent distance, but not all the way across the world instead of maybe 400 gil, it's going to cost 300 gil. They softened the curve a bit so that the further you go, yeah, it's a lot more expensive, but the the curve on the way there is lower. You're going to save some gil on the closer costs that weren't already 999 gil. So get hunting for teleport, tic for teleport tickets, by the way. You're going to want them now. And then they also updated the Aethernet within towns. There's a map added on alongside the list of locations. It, you, now you can see where you're teleporting to before you teleport. Even if that's outside the town, it'll show you the if you're teleporting to Central Thanalan, it will show you the Central Thanalan map. That's cool. And you can even click on the map, the mini Aetherites on the map. You could just click on them to instantly go there. I want to go here. Click, you're already there. That That's great. That's really great. It's the little stuff that really makes you happy for the, that really makes you happy. It's stuff like that that's great. And oh yeah, for some reason they put it here. Fish's intuition will remain progressed when offline. This is great for us big fishes. So fish's intuition is like catch three of this fish for a special buff to catch another fish. That's super rare. And so if you catch two fish, log off, and then log back in and catch one more fish, you will get intuition. You don't have to start over back from zero. That's useful for when windows are at odd times or anything like that. That makes things easier to deal with. And then finally, the final thing they talked about was data central travel is scheduled for after 6.0. 
to fix. They're waiting until congestion dies down. They don't want to implement data center travel with how huge the game got all of a sudden. This is this is smart to just hold off just because we got a huge influx of people and expansion launches are huge influxes of people as well. So we already have way too many people. Expansion launch, even more people. They don't want to potentially break the servers, not be able to correctly identify bugs because they can't tell if it's because congestion or because data center travel. So they're going to hold off on data center travel a while just to make sure the launch goes off well. Which that that's a smart thing to do. People will probably be upset about it. But it's it's the right call, I would say. It's definitely the right call to hold off. And then that was it for the live letter. I mean, they also talked about stuff to buy, t-shirts and all that, the next fan fest and all that, etc, etc. But I mean, that's... They're gonna do a lot of promoting for that another time. I don't think that's really worth going over here, personally. Especially with how long this got already. That was a long live letter. It was a, it was a five hour live letter. It went until four, almost 4 a.m. That was, And I went to bed at 3 a.m. So it's like, I missed some of the stuff and had to rewatch it afterward. So it was long. If you think this is long and is a digest of it, and me also giving my thoughts, this is a fraction of the time it took to go through the actual thing. Whew. But okay, that's it. So I'm going to rest my voice now. I'm excited for Reaper. Dragoon looks cool. There's some cool changes. Poor Scholar. Hopefully the Media Tour shows off. There's more to it than just a walk speed boost. But take care and may the power of Ananid Hogsley waste your enemies.